Happy Wednesday. Good evening. It's good to see your faces. I just really enjoyed my day and spending time with you today, so that was really a blessing for me. And I was really, I'm, I'm really thankful for that prayer. I need prayer. And I'm, I'm going to tell you that I need, I need more prayer tonight than I did last night. And for those of you who knows this trend, I'm going to need more prayer tomorrow than I do tonight. So please pray more. Someone gave me a, 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 a quote. One of my sisters handed this to me. And I was like, wow, please, when you're praying, pray this prayer for me, please. It says, it is the privilege of the watchmen on the walls of Zion to live so near to God and to be susceptible to the impressions of his spirit that he can work through them to tell men and women of their peril and point them to the place of safety. And I was like, wow, we can all have that experience as watchmen. And so we should be praying to that end. Pray for me to that end, that I can be so close to Jesus, close, so near to God. I do hope that with what we've been looking at so far, specifically last night, my prayer uh, for you and your Christian walk is that you could be able to listen to a message that we hear that you've heard and then say, wow, I can actually apply that to my life. That's what my, my prayer really is. So, um, you know, these are just things that, that the Lord has shown me, things I'm like, Lord, I just, you know, help me to apply that to, to my life. And I really, really want to see you in the kingdom. And so I want to share things you can say, you know what, I can apply that to my life, to my life. And so again, and for the next uh, few nights, we're going to be looking at things of that nature, things you can really apply to your life. <clears throat> Tonight's message, um, I want to ask you a question before we go into it. I don't know if you ever heard the idea, if you ever talked to someone who was a lot older than you, and they would say something like, back in my day. Has anyone ever heard that? Like, back in my day. Or better yet, they had those little stories where they say, you know, um, I remember having to walk so many miles in the snow uphill. You ever heard that? Boy, I tell you, you know, there's a principle behind that story, those types of stories and for me, because I like stories, I always would ask, the, the, my mindset is always, how did you do that? How did you do that? And in, that, in my mindset, just so you can understand, in my mindset in asking that question, there's two thoughts that really come to my mind. Number one, that was really hard. What you did was really, really hard. I respect that. My hat's off too. That was hard. The other thing that comes to my mind is, when I'm talking to someone who's older than me, my thought is, what can I learn from what you did that can help me with what I'm trying to do. Do you understand that? So when I ask that question, how did you do that? I'm really asking the question, I'm really saying, that's really hard, but what can I learn from you that can help with what I'm doing? Our message tonight is entitled, How Did Jesus Do That? How did Jesus do that? Let us pray. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for being so kind to us. Lord, you've been so kind to us so far, and I'm asking once again that you be kind to us again. Lord, as we look at our topic tonight, we need the help of the Holy Spirit to, make, to let it make sense to us and the grace to apply it to our lives and, and the hope that we will glorify you with it. Lord, that's our prayer. We ask this in the name of your dear son, Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bible, I ask you to go with me to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, we learned, I believe it was maybe this morning, that who was the closest disciple to Jesus? It was John. And I want us to notice something about what John says in John chapter 16 and verse 33. There's a principle we'll see in the book of John here. In John chapter 16 and looking at verse 33, notice what the Bible says as we read. Are we there? I assume that we're there. I don't really hear any pages turning. Okay, so notice what the Bible says. It says, These things I have spoken unto you, Jesus is speaking, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have done what, everyone? I have overcome the world. Go with me in your Bible, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Jesus tells his disciples, he says, Listen, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But notice what the Bible says here in 1 John chapter 5. We're looking at verse 4. 
All right, I hear a few pages turning. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, notice what the Bible says. This is John speaking again, by the way. And he says this, For whatsoever is born of God doth what? Overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I hope you understand from this verse why last night's topic was so important. Why I said last night, if you don't get last night's topic, then the rest of these are kind of null and void. But what I want us to understand really from the scripture, Jesus says, he said, look, be of good cheer. He says, I have overcome the world. But in this verse, he actually says in this passage, he says that you too, he says, for whatsoever is born of God doth what? Overcome the world. Jesus overcame the world. We can overcome the world. What Jesus did, we ought to do. Go with me in your Bible, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Notice, again, this is John speaking. I think we ought to listen to John because John was close to Jesus, wasn't he? I think we do well to listen to him. Notice what John says in Revelation chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 20. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Are we there? Amen. Okay. The Bible says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is speaking again. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And then he says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Notice the next phrase. Even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. This is not John speaking now, but this is from the words, the the lips of Jesus. Jesus says, listen, you need to overcome. But how am I going to overcome Jesus? Overcome the way that I overcame. Well, the question we ask tonight is how did Jesus overcome? How did Jesus overcome? Go with me in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 4. I want us to notice this point. Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 15, 14. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. And the Bible says this, Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, Let us hold fast our profession. I love verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Have you ever seen some of those people that are like, look, you know what? I did it so you can do it. Just get over it. That's not Jesus. Jesus accomplished something, but he doesn't look at us that way. He says, listen, I know what you're going through. I was touched with what you were touched with. But notice the Bible doesn't stop there with Jesus. Notice what it says as it continues. It says, he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. If you want to know how Jesus overcame, Jesus was able to overcome at every point. He never sinned. It doesn't matter how great the temptation was. It doesn't matter how much it seems the struggle was. Jesus was able to be victorious. And he says, that's how we ought to overcome. And I don't know about you. When I look at that, I think to myself, how did Jesus do it? How did Jesus do it? You know, something else I'm so thankful for. I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit sent Jesus into the wilderness. You know why I'm so thankful for that? Because it's almost like when the Holy Spirit, that time Jesus was baptized and Jesus is now going into the wilderness, it's like the Holy Spirit knew that someone down in, 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 in Amity, Arkansas in 2020 was going to be struggling with something. And God is like, listen, I need to sit, put something in the word of God so they can understand how to overcome the way Jesus did it. You have to understand, Jesus went through that. It wasn't just like happenstance or the Holy Spirit was just like, look, I just want you to suffer. No, God was thinking of us. So he says, I need inspiration to put that into the account. I need the, 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 the prophets to write that because someone in 2020 is going to be struggling with overcoming, and they need to overcome the way Jesus did it. So my question is, Jesus, how did you do it? Let's go in our Bibles in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If there's anything that I believe that we need to understand, especially living in the last days, is how to overcome temptation. How do I do it? And here's the beautiful thing. When we overcome, do you notice the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 that when we overcome, we will sit with God in his what? Throne, even as Jesus overcame and sat with his father in his throne. 
There is no connection closer than the Father and the Son on the throne. And we're talking about getting to know God. God is saying, listen, I want to give you that same experience. You can have that same experience. You can sit with your father, my father in his throne. That's what Jesus wants to give. But he says, look, the way you do it is the way I do it. Don't try to come up with your own ways of doing it. Don't try to think, oh, I can have this checklist. I get this, and I get this, and I get this. Yes, and then I'm going to go overcome. Jesus is like, no, that's not going to work. you got to do it the way I did it. And so the Bible has given us principles of how that's done. And we're going to look at that tonight. We're all familiar with this. These are the temptations of Jesus, aren't we? We're all really familiar with this. We know the temptation was, the first temptation was what? It was appetite. We understand that. The first temptation was appetite. The second temptation was what? Yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, I think that Ellen White calls it the love of display, which leads to a word that started with P, presumption. And then we find that the, the, the last temptation Riches of the world. These are three points. In fact, it was very interesting. I was reading before I came here in, the, in, in one of the volumes of the testimony. I wish I could remember what it was. I don't know if it's volume six or volume three. But we're told that, that Satan wants to get us in, in all three points. And if he can get us in appetite, it would weaken us for the next ones. Wow. And I thought about this. I said, wow, do, do, you, do you realize that if Satan can get us in appetite, I'm more susceptible to be presumptuous. Oh, it doesn't matter to God. It's not a big thing. And if Satan can get me to be presumptuous, then I will be more susceptible to be world-loving. Do you understand that? If Satan can get us one in one, it will lead us to the other. Those are three temptations. But what I want us to understand tonight, I want us to go a little bit deeper. What were the temptations of Jesus? We're going to look at each one of these temptations but we're also going to find from each one of these temptations, how did Jesus respond to them? Because this is how Jesus overcame. Matthew chapter 4, we're going to look at the first temptation. We're looking at uh, verse 1. And the Bible says, Then Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. I looked at all the different Bible versions. None of them really do this, this word justice. It says Jesus was afterward a hungered. Jesus was at the point of death. He was starving. I was trying to look up all the big words to, to name this. I was like, you know what? Let me just stick with what I know. Jesus was starving. He was like, you could probably not even notice who he was. Like, Jesus, this was 40 days, over a month. The Bible says he was afterward a hungered. And then in verse 3, the Bible says, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. So we understand this temptation. We already identified that this was a temptation of appetite. We already know that. You could probably even throw in there passion. Passion could be thrown in here as well. And oftentimes when we read this temptation, like, oh, wow, there's a temptation of appetite. And we look at ourselves, we're like, well, you know what? I struggle with that temptation of appetite too. But oftentimes when we look at the temptation of appetite, we look at the temptation of appetite as to something that we like and desire, but we don't need it. So, for example, when I look at my life, I can see, wow, I really struggle with appetite. In fact, I had the, you know, I call it like the, the three brothers, the three C's. I love chicken, chocolate, and cheese. I, those were my struggles, chicken, chocolate, cheese. I loved a lot of chicken, I loved a lot of chocolate, and I loved a lot of cheese. And I'm going to tell you something. By the way, God will help you, whatever the, your struggle may be. I can remember when I got to Washita Hills, I had kind of conquered, I, well, I didn't kind of, by God's grace, I was like, oh, man, the, the chicken thing is not there anymore. The chocolate thing is not there anymore. I kind of substituted for paydays. But the cheese... Wow, this one is so hard. And I knew that cheese was not good for me. I specifically, probably more than anyone else, I could not handle cheese in my diet because I had asthma really bad. And my mother discovered every time I used to like to eat cheese pizzas that were like, like I would call like, can you get the extra cheese, you know? I love those thick cheese pizzas. And my mom said, and my mom knew. She would see me at night and, she, and like before I would have an asthma attack, my eyes would get dark, just really dark. And she was like, you've been eating cheese, haven't you? I was like, how did you know? And she was like, I can see it. It's in your eyes. And then that night, I would suffer, have this, this attack. 
And I start realizing, I don't need this thing. This is killing me, but I love it. I love cheese. So when I got to Washita Hills, I was thinking to myself, you know, by the way, praise the Lord, we didn't have it here, so it was a little easier. But I can remember after canvassing, my, my um, first cam- summer canvassing, I was a canvassing leader, um, a junior leader, and my first t- summer canvassing, we all know, well, I shouldn't say we all know, maybe, maybe this doesn't happen in a Washita Hills programs, but in other programs, you know you eat a lot of this restaurant that starts with a T. Okay, maybe it happens to you too. Taco Bell. So I know, like, man, where are we going to get to eat? Taco Bell. Where are we going to get? By the time that my summer was over, I was so sick of Taco Bell. Didn't want to see one. Anyway, but during the summer, we would go to Taco Bell. And by the way, to help me to overcome this appetite problem, I started reading a book called Diets and Foods. And every morning I would read that. And if you were with some of my students, they'd probably say, they'd probably tell you that every morning I would like to share what I'm learning. So I'm like, yeah, did you know such and such and such and such? They're like, oh, okay, yeah. Did you know such and such and such and such? I was reading these things, but I knew in my heart I was struggling. I was really struggling, especially when it came to cheese. And so then I was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. And I I would go to Taco Bell. And when I go to Taco Bell, how come when I get in line, I'm like, excuse me, ma'am, can you do that without cheese? I'm like, sure, sure, sure. How come when I get my burrito back, I would always have cheese? And so me, I would say, you know, I don't want to give them a hard time. It's, all these students, I'll just eat it this time. Next time, next time, I'll tell them. So I'll eat it. And then the next week, I'll go back, or not next week, like the next day, I'll go back and I'm like, yeah, yeah, can, can you get that without cheese? Oh, yeah, 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 I got you. It has cheese in it. Every week, I was like, you know, you know. I don't want to give them a hard time. You know, we got to be Christian here. We can't show them we're complaining. And finally, this would go on for a while. And I remember one time we were in, we were at lunch. I'm sitting there with my students, and I'm like talking diets and foods while eating my burrito with cheese in it. And I'm talking diets and foods, and I had one student from New York, and I love that brother, but he was always lifting weights kind of into his health. And he's kind of talking. He's like listening. He's eating his food. He's listening. He's like, is this true? And one of my students, one of my other students, they, I guess, you know, they kind of grew up noise. They said, yeah, everything he's saying is true. Like, cheese is harmful, man. And, you, and he's like, really? And he's just like, yo, I'm done. And I'm like, are you serious? The next time we go to Taco Bell, he got a burrito, asked for no cheese, but they made a mistake in his burrito. And he goes back. He's like, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, you know, I had che-. And I'm sitting like, how did he do that? And through watching him, God helped me. Like, I was like, brother, we got to help each other. Here I am telling him, but he had the strong will to be like, no. And so I was like, we got to help each other. And I never went back to cheese. I was the type of person who was going to be like, hey, excuse me, (laughs) ma'am. Yeah, I can't handle it. He was like, oh, okay, we're so sorry. Well, you want to take this one? I'll make you another one. Like, no, 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 no. No, I can't handle it. God gave me victory. You'd be surprised what God would do. I remember when I first got here at the school, I remember I mentioned the paydays, right? Oh, I love paydays. It was better than what I was getting before. Like, I used to really love chocolate. And I was like, this is a little healthy. It has peanuts all over it. It's like, this is healthy. So my first month, probably my first month here at school, every Friday, I went to, they used to have a, the gas station that called Carly's Corner. I think it used to be called that. And I would go up there. I would drive up there in my car <laughs> Friday. And I was like, oh, man. And I would, I would go buy a payday. And I was like, you know, enjoyed a little Sabbath snack before Sabbath came in. And uh, I did this every week. And I can remember God used one of my good friends. Love that brother. But he noticed. And he says, brother, he says, I noticed you really like those paydays, don't you? And I got mad. And I was like, well, you don't know what I was eating before. And I, and I went off and I was like, ah, oh, I was being convicted. And I was like, man, I know I really should leave this alone. But he doesn't know. He doesn't know the struggle. And then, and then the Lord did something really, the Lord was so kind to me. You know, being a student at Washtenaw Hills, it's not like your bank account is growing. And you don't, have a, you don't have a job like that. And if you're getting paydays every week, and if you're spending the gas to do it, what's happening to your account? It's not even just stagnant, it's going down. And because my account was going down, I was like, Lord, I can't do this. I don't get enough paydays to keep eating paydays. <laughs> I, I don't do that, you yeah. know? So... Through that, through that time, I started thinking more about what this brother has shared with me. 
And my friends, by God's grace, I'd never eaten a payday since. By God's grace, God will help us. I tell you that because I just want you to know that even though I might look slim, I know what it's like to struggle with appetite. I know what it's like. But let me tell you something. The problem with appetite goes deeper than the thing you like. And you're just like, oh, I'm struggling. I know I don't need it, but I like it. Appetite goes deeper than that. If you notice in this story, Satan doesn't come to Jesus. He doesn't tell him, you know what, Jesus, you know, you haven't eaten. If, you, if thou be the son of God, I command that you turn the, or, or, or if thou be the son of God, turn these stones into shrimp. Satan doesn't say that. He said, turn these stones into what? Into bread. Here's the inter- interesting thing about bread. Bread is something that you need. Jesus was starving for 40 days. He especially needed it. He wasn't like eating between meals. This was 40 days. But Jesus chose not to eat it because if he were to eat it, he was going against God's word. Here's the point. When it comes to even our food, something that you need, if it goes against God's word, it's still wrong. Jesus would have shown, you know, here's the thing. You remember the other morning we were talking about the idea that when Jesus was led into the wilderness, God led him out there and he says, you're my beloved son. But you remember uh, when we were talking, we were talking about how Jesus was God's beloved son, but it looked like God wasn't taking care of him. It could have looked like that. Wow, I don't have food. I don't have a place to stay. It could have looked like God forsaken him. If Jesus would have went and said, you know what, Lord, I, you know, Father, I don't see you coming through on this, so I got to take this in my own hands and save myself. Let me, get, let me turn this into bread. It would have showed that Jesus did not trust his Father to provide. And I started thinking, I was like, Lord, how often do we do this? How often do we come into certain situations and instead of trusting God, we actually go ahead and say, well, I got to take this into my own hands. Jesus' response, notice the Bible says, Bible says in verse 4, this was Jesus' answer. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Was there anything wrong with the bread? No. In fact, later in his prayer, he's like, look, you know, give us, Lord, our daily bread. There's nothing wrong with bread. But God was saying, listen, or or Jesus was saying here, listen, I'm not dependent upon this bread to live. This might be needful for me, but I'm not dependent upon it. I'm dependent upon every word of God. And this temptation can apply to us in every situation. You know, whatever it is that is temporal that we think we need, that is not what we live by. A Christian lives by every word of God. You say, well, how do I apply that to my life? You know, in my family, I know there has been times we needed lawyers for things. But you know the tendency of man to be? When we get in those situations... We have to have the mindset of saying, man should not live by lawyers alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It doesn't mean that lawyers are bad, but man should not live by that. You know, when we get sick, you know what the Christian says? Man should not live by doctors alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It doesn't mean that doctors aren't needed, but that's not what we put our faith in. How about your studies here at school? Oh, man, you got that test just coming up. You know, like, oh, boy, I got to really study for this thing. This is a big exam. And so you're thinking to yourself, like, ah, maybe I should skip out on my devotions because uh, this is big. Man should not live by your studies alone and your brain power, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This became a big temptation because Jesus was trying to demonstrate to us that even though this is something I need, but if I, if I do that in the face of disobeying God, then I have sinned. No, I live by independence of my Father. You know, when I Bible work, I meet a lot of people that says, you know what? Um, I know I want to keep the Sabbath, but my job. Man should not live by his work efforts alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The first principle we can learn, the very first principle, that we can learn from Jesus in overcoming sin is our ultimate and and total dependence on God. Don't try to try to fix things yourself. You have total dependence on God. And so often as human nature, we want to depend on things that are temporal. We want to depend on man. We want to depend upon ourselves. God says, no, that's not going to work. If you're going to be an overcomer, 
You must live by every word, by faith in what God can do and not you. That's principle number one. Jesus was totally dependent. Then we come to our next temptation. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse 5, Satan actually got smart this time. By the way, he showed up as an angel. They didn't recognize him. He got smart here. The Bible says, Then the devil taketh him up into, a holy, a holy, uh, into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou, shalt da- thou dash thy foot against a stone. Ellen White talks about this, and she says, you know, it's very interesting that in this, in this temptation, Satan's like, look, hey, Jesus, you want to use the word of God? I'm going to use the word of God. And so he comes to Jesus, but she says that he omits something. He omits the idea uh, that Jesus would keep, or, or the angels would keep him in, his, in the way which he should go, and that is in the Lord's way, in the Lord's way. God would protect you if you're going into a situation and let's say you're going to a place when you're canvassing. I, I remember canvassing in, in places where some people call them red light districts. I remember being in one in Louisiana and there was this young, this young lady I knew what she was all about. And the first thing she did was she came to, she was coming my direction and I was like, well, I don't want to pass a person. And I just, I, I even skipped the health books and handed out the God's answers. And I was like, I canvassed on the God's answers. And as soon as she saw it, she was like, you know, she thought there was something else in mind, but that was not that. And I handed her the God's answers, and she was, you could tell she just got serious. And she bought that book. I was in a, it was in a dangerous place for the mind. But God kept me. But God never gives us license to go into places that are forbidden for us, to just rightfully go into, there, into, that, into those places. In fact, Jesus says, notice his answer. It says, and Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Quoting from the book of Exodus. Jesus was simply saying, listen, don't try to force the God to work a miracle on your behalf. Don't place yourself. When he placed himself in that pinnacle, don't place yourself in, 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 if he would have thrown himself out of that pinnacle, it would have been as though he was placing himself in harm's way and expecting God to save him. How do we do that in our lives? How often have we placed ourselves in harm's way expecting God to save us? I can't tell you, and by the way, God was so merciful, I can't tell you time and time again how many times I used to go out and hang out with my friends, and I was like, Lord, please be with me. Don't let anything bad happen to me. And I think it's only the mercy of God that came through that. God didn't have to do that because that's presumption. Oh, I'm going to do this, and it's okay. Oh, I'm going to eat that, and it's okay. God, is, oh, he understands. God is going to forgive me. And Satan would even sometimes use scripture to, t- to, to, to tempt you. He would say, hey, look, brother, if you know this, God knows you're weak. And guess what? Even if you sin, there's an advocate to the Father. Don't worry. That's presumption. Jesus did not place himself in the position where he would be in harm's way. He did not go on, or on forbidden ground. Well, let me tell you this. There's another way we can go on forbidden ground. And that's not for us to go in a place, but that's making where we are the forbidden ground. You say, well, what are you talking about? How does that work? Let me read a quote to you. <clears throat> this is actually um, in Acts of the Apostles, page 518. I want us to think about this for a moment. Ellen White says, those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. The heart must be faithfully sentineled, or evils without will awaken evils within, and the soul will wander in darkness. Do you realize that you can make where you are forbidden ground? By the things we're putting here, by the things we're thinking about. And, you know, I can see this, and, and, we, str- and we struggle with this. I can see this in my life to where I have watched so many movies, I could probably make my own horror movie just about all the information I have here. Not just one, but a series of them. And my mind will wonder. And every time I allow my mind to wonder, where I am now becomes forbidden ground. 
The principle that we have to learn from Jesus is that Jesus shunned everything that would take his soul from Christ. Jesus didn't go on forbidden ground, not just with his feet, but also with his mind. If there's a second principle I want to share with you, is that you and I must avoid every, avoid everything that will cause us to fall to temptation. Second principle. The third principle that Jesus had. Go with me in your Bible. The Bible actually speaks in verse 8. It says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the glories of the kingdom of the world, kingdoms of the world. And the glory of, uh, he saw, showed him all the kings of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. This would have been an easy way, right, for Jesus to get the kingdom back. Fall down and worship Satan. This is easy. You, this is what you came to do to restore the kingdom, restore the world. But Jesus said unto him, Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The first principle we learned tonight is that Jesus was fully dependent upon God. Second principle we learned is that he shunned anything that would even lead him to temptation. He shunned it. He didn't go on forbidden ground. He didn't make his place where he was forbidden ground. But the third principle we can learn tonight is that Jesus had an undivided devotion for his Father in heaven. He had a love for his Father in heaven. Well, you say, well, how do we really, really see it? We understand that he didn't, he didn't bow down to, to, lose, to Satan, but how else do we really see his love and devotion to his Father? I want to tell you, ask you something. Maybe I won't ask you. Maybe I'll just tell you. I can see in my life oftentimes when I was tempted, whatever it is, especially when it was a really, really hard temptation, a difficult one, a struggle, you know what I always do? I was like, Lord, this temptation is very hard for, for me. Lord, I'm really struggling with this. Lord, this is really tough. you got to help me. And I understand God answers those prayers. I understand that. But when I was reading this, I was like, wait a minute. There's something different about the way I face temptation and the way Jesus faces temptation. I want you to think about this. When Jesus was faced with the temptation of food, Jesus says, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When Jesus was faced with the, with the second temptation, cast yourself down, Jesus says, thou should not tempt the Lord thy God. When Jesus was faced with this temptation, Jesus says, thou shalt worship the Lord thy, so that the central focus of Jesus' temptation was not him, it was his father. And I said to myself, wow, that's the key. So often I live for myself so much so that when the temptations come, the first thing I think about is me. But Lord, I have to get to the point where I'm saying, look, I know that temptation might be hard, but I can't do it because I love him. And that was Jesus' focus. It was always his father. He had a complete, undivided devotion to his father so that when temptation comes, his natural reaction is like, how would this treat, how would this treat the father? It wasn't him. And I said, Lord, that's what I need. I don't have that love for God like that. And this is why I believe Ellen White says in the book Desire of Ages, we must spend a thought for hour each day thinking on the life of Jesus, especially what? The closing scenes, because it's in thinking about the life of Jesus that something starts to happen. It's like, I love him. I love him. And temptations come. You're like, listen, Satan, I don't know what you're trying to do with that, but I love Jesus too much. You got to go get behind me. My undivided devotion is Jesus. Now, some of you probably say, well, I'm not at that point. You know, I just, I feel so weak. I struggle. Let me tell you something. Here's the hope. Jesus is still there to help you too. I want to tell you something. I had a, a situation some, t- some years ago, some time ago, and I can remember really struggling. God had convicted me on something, and most people might think, oh, that wasn't a bad thing. But for me, I knew it was, it, was, it was not good. And so God convicted me on it. I was like, I need this out of my life. It separated me between me and God. But for some odd reason, this one specific day, it was like, oh, man, I just I wanted this so bad. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go down to the store, and I'm going to buy this. Now, I didn't have any cash. I just had a card. But I was like, Lord. And by the way, sometimes we don't know why things come up in our lives. Sometimes it's like it might be stress. 
It might be, you know, Satan is throwing his commercials at you. You don't even realize it. That's why now when I'm, 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 I'm praying to be watchful, if something pops up or someone shows me some, or some food I used to like or something comes up, and, and even though at the moment you might not feel tempted by it, but guess what Satan does? He'll throw something to your mind the first time. You start, it's in the back of your mind, and then later on you're feeling tempted. Like, where did that come from? You got to be watchful. So now when I see it, if I notice it, I'm like, Lord, please help me be, no, notice it. If I notice it, I'm like, Lord, I'm praying right there. I'm like, Lord, get that out of my mind. Because I might not be tempted by it right now, but later on, that's why I have to guard ourselves when we're in the, in the grocery stores. You might be sitting up there, you're in the, in the checkout line, it's like, oh, I have no itch. And then something comes up in the checkout line, you're just like, wow. And you're like, well, that's not tempting me. But later on, it's like, why am I craving that? Satan is very smart. He knows how to bring his commercials to our mind. So we have to pray. We have to be guarded, have to watch. Anyway, I don't know what brought me to this situation, but I was like, Lord, I don't know what it is, but I'm having this war with the flesh. I want to go and get this thing. So I'm driving in my car, and in my car, I was like, Lord, generally when I'm tempted and, I'm, and it's this strong, I don't even want to pray. I don't want to pray. And you might have been there. It's like, man, I, I want to do this so much, I don't want to pray. And I was like, I don't even want to pray. But I was like, Lord, in my heart, I want to love you. So if I can think of that demoniac, and when he was coming to Jesus, you asked him his name, nothing came out, but you read his heart. I said, Lord, you have to read my heart right now. And so I'm praying on the way, and I'm like, Lord, help me. I'm, saying, I'm quoting 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Make a way of escape. <laughs> I need you right now, but if you don't help me right now, this is where I'm going, <laughs> and I'm driving, and I'm going, and I'm going. Did I tell you I didn't have any cash on me? I didn't have any cash. I just had a card. I was like, I'm going to have to use that, and so I'm driving, and I'm get pulling the parking lot. I was like, Lord, I still feel this. Like, I, don't, I, I need help right now because I'm going to this parking lot. You need, I need you. Get out. I'm going into the store, and I was like, Lord, here it goes. I don't feel anything yet. I'm praying. It's like, I just don't seem like I have the wherewithal to just, to, to just re- flee from this thing. Everybody, even if they looked at me as like I was crazy, I'll just run. But I said, like, I don't have any strength. Like, Lord, help me. You promised a way of escape. And I'm going to the store. I was like, Lord, here it is. Like, I prayed, I prayed, and I don't feel anything. It, it just seemed like this is just overpowering. At that moment, I get into the store. This gentleman comes in behind me, and it was just a nice little country store, not from where we are. Gentleman comes in behind me, and the lady at the cash register, I don't know if they knew each other, but they had this like friendly greeting. And she's like, hey, how are you doing? You know, they, just, they just kind of talk or whatever. And suddenly as they're talking, the man, she tells the man, she's like, well, I hope you have cash because unfortunately our card machine broke down today and we don't know when it's going to work. I heard that. I didn't have cash. I only had a card. And the first thing that came out of my lips was like, praise the Lord. And the feeling went away. God had made a way of escape for me in my weakness. My heart was crying out. My mind was struggling with God, but my flesh was like fighting itself. And I was thinking for a moment, God, have you left me in the corner in the boxing match getting beat up? Have you thrown in the towel? God says, no, no. It's like I'm right here. He made a way of escape. Now, this is the thing I want to tell you. When God makes the way of escape, our job is to take it. I want you to remember something. If he make it, you take it. Because if you don't take it and you stay there any longer, you're toast. You will fail. It's not you might fail. It's not you if you will. I can guarantee you will. If God make it, you take it. You got to. That's your part. Run as fast as you can. It doesn't matter if people think you're crazy. You do it because you love Jesus. God made a way of escape. In closing, I want to share something with you tonight. Here's a quotation. Ellen White says in Manuscript Releases, Volume 6, she says, John pointed the people to the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. He said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. There is a great deal in that taken away. Now watch what she says. The question is, shall we keep on sinning as though if as though if it were an impossibility for us to overcome? She says, should we keep sinning like it is not possible? By the way, I need to tell you, if you sin, there's an advocate to the Father. But God doesn't want you to sin. I need to share something before I finish this quote. I have a Bible study contact who struggled for years with alcohol. And when I came to him, he said, you know, and he was just, he, he had a moment where he fell. He says, you know, I know that Jesus is an advocate to the Father. I know my, my old pastors and everyone says, 
And he says, but let me tell you something. He's like, if the gospel just forgives me and doesn't give me victory, then that's no gospel. There's joy in having victory in Jesus. You can't find it. Don't try to find it yourself. If you're trying to do it yourself, checklist, that's a burden. There's joy and victory in Jesus. Jesus, Ellen White says, the question is, is, shall we keep on sinning as though it were an impossibility for us to overcome? How are we to overcome? She says this, as Christ overcame. And that is the only way. He prayed to his heavenly father, we can do the same. When tempted to to speak wrong and do wrong, resist Satan and, and say, I will not surrender my will to your control. I cooperate with the divine power and through grace be conquered. If you make it, you take it. When I was here at Washita Hills, I remember I loved to hear the academy students preach. I loved it. And there was friends of mine. We looked forward to it. Academy students preach like, man, so-and-so's preach. Oh, man, I'm I'm, I'm ready. I'm there. In fact, we were so, we were very, really fond of the academy. I remember there was other things that the academy would do. We would joke about, um, when, when we leave Washtenaw Hills, it's was like, man, I'm going to graduate to the academy. Because we were like, man, it's just the blessing that they, that they have. But I used to love when I hear academy students preach. And I can remember, I don't know if it was a Friday night or a Wednesday. I know I heard some of you talk about how you, you still do that. But there was one young lady that preached one night, and she said something. Uh, it was a beautiful sermon, but she said something. In a, she gave a story at the end of her sermon that, that just touched my heart so much, I never forget it. I, I remind myself of it. I've shared it with other people. And um, that story really spoke to my heart. And I'm sorry if I don't tell it the way she told it. But I want to tell you that story tonight. The story goes that there was this little girl, and she was sitting on her dad's lap, looking in her dad's eyes. And she looks at her dad, and she says, Daddy, um, can a person live without sinning? Her daddy looks at her and says, I'm sorry, my child, my little one. That's, uh, no one can live without sin. And the girl was a little, she was a little distraught by it, she was a little troubled, but she tried again. She said, Daddy, you don't think that a person can live without sinning for just one year? What about one year? And he says, whoa, one year is a long time. He's like, no one can live without sinning for, for a year. That's just too long. I'm sorry. But she wouldn't give up. She said, Daddy, can a person live without sinning for a month? Like even a month? And he said, no, can't live without a month. She wouldn't give up. She just kept in. But every time she would ask this question, she'd just feel more and more distressed. She'd just be more and more sad. And she went down to a week. And finally she said, Lord, uh, Daddy, can a person live with, uh, with just one day? And Daddy said, look, I know this may sound short, but one day no one can live without sinning for one day. And a little girl almost wanted to give up. But she was so like, this was just in her heart. She loved Jesus. So she looked at her Daddy and said, Daddy, can a person live without sinning for just one moment? Her dad thought about it. He said, you know, maybe for a moment, a person can live without sinning. The little girl's eyes opened up. She got this big smile on her face. She looked into her dad's eyes. She said, well, Daddy, I guess I have to live moment by moment. <laughs> My friends, and that's our experience. That's our experience. And it's not until we come to the point that we recognize that, Lord, I need you moment by moment. I'm totally dependent upon you. It's not until we come to that moment that we will overcome sin. Jesus wants to give it to us. Tonight as we pray, I want us to be praying for one another. I want us to be praying, Lord, give us that moment by moment experience. I can look, I can read. Some of us, we can have our devotions and we still fall. But God says, I want to give you the moment by moment experience. I'm going to pray, but then I want to ask you if you can get in maybe a groups of two together, like we always do. And I want us to pray for one another. I want us to pray that God would help us to, to gain that victory because we know statistically, people say, well, wow, a room like this, very small sample will be saved, right? But it doesn't have to be. We can have the hope that every soul here can be in the kingdom of heaven by the grace of God. So we're going to pray to that end tonight. If we can all kneel, well, let me pray. and then we'll, we'll pray together. Our loving Father in heaven, I thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you so much that you want us in your kingdom. 
you want us to be saved. But Lord, help us to realize how much we need you. Help us to realize, Lord, to shun everything that separates us from you. And help us, Lord, to realize that when temptation comes, our love and our loyalty is to you and you alone. Lord, we ask for your grace to this end. I ask this for my brothers and sisters here. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so pleased you could join us here at Watchtower Hills Academy and College. And if you have enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you would like to support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description below. Thank you so much for joining us, and may God richly bless you.